All right, thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Melinda McGoldrick and I manage the Energize Our Neighborhoods program for the city of Boise. Thank you for joining us for this session of our Energize Ed workshop series. We're really excited um, today to have Shannon Rush call from Strello Group here to teach us about powerful, productive and inclusive meetings. So Shannon, thank you for joining us. Um, very briefly here, I wanted to cover a few quick housekeeping things. So we will have everybody on mute, um, at least during uh, the times when Shannon is talking. That way we don't have a bunch of background noise going on. I believe there will be a few times when Shannon will be asking you guys for some feedback or involvement. So please feel free to unmute yourself at that time. Or if you have questions in your chat, um, questions that you don't want to ask out loud, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will um, kind of keep an eye on that and make sure that we have a chance to get to all of those. Um, so Shannon, I will let you briefly introduce yourself and then take it away. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Melinda. And thanks to each of you for joining today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, my name is Shannon Rush Call, and I am the co-founder of a, co a coaching and consulting organization called Strello Group. Uh, my business partner is Dr. Joanne Chu, who happens to sit in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm here in Boise, Idaho. And um, we, we, Strello Group, um, lead our clients through high stakes strategic change. And we do that in such a way uh, that we embody the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we operate from a very strong belief set that um, inclusion and collective wisdom is, the, is at the heart of sustainable and strategic change. So I'm particularly excited to talk to you about uh, today's conversation on powerful, productive, and inclusive meetings. And I'm going to put this link in the chat one more time. So for those of you who are just joining, um, if you can please join me on this document. Um, this is our meeting plan, which I'm going to be teaching you about the dimensions of a meeting plan that create the conditions for a team to do amazing work and create the conditions for inclusion. So I want to be modeling um, how we're using this design throughout our time today. So if you're with me in the document, and I think I'll share my screen um, also just uh, to make sure that everybody is able to follow along. Um, this is a two page document, which we often think of as a strategy document uh, for meetings. And in meetings uh, that Strello designs and facilitates and that we teach others to facilitate, we often start with what we call a check-in. And I wanna explain a little bit about our check-in and we're at our noon slot, um, five minutes to get started uh, with our check-in. So a check-in from a, from a content perspective, so what it is, is an opportunity for us to do two things um, as we're starting a meeting. The first thing that a check-in allows us to do is to get present. Um, oftentimes, many times, we're moving uh, between and amongst uh, different meetings in our day or coming and going in and out of our organizations or our neighborhood meetings, and it is difficult to get present, both physically as well as mentally. So a check-in allows an explicit opportunity for us to be present with one another. The second function that a check-in serves is it allows us to begin to be in relationship. Um, when we are doing collaborative work, when we're wanting to operate from and, and behave and work uh, from a place of inclusion, being in relationship with one another is at the core of our ability to do that. So a check-in creates a way for us to begin to be in relationship. From a process perspective, the way that we check in, and this is important, um, that we check in um, using a process called council process. And council process is an opportunity for each of us to speak um, uninterrupted, one at a time, without crosstalk. When we start a meeting, uh, hearing from every person who's a part of that particular meeting, we are already creating the conditions for inclusion. And once we've had the opportunity to hear our own voice in the room, we're much more likely uh, to be willing to engage and participate going forward. So we're gonna model uh, very quickly uh, this, this afternoon, the check-in process. And I'm gonna ask each of you to check in. Um, so when I call your name, I'm gonna ask that you unmute. And if you feel comfortable enough to do so, please also um, share your video. I would love to be able to see you. 
And the check-in prompt for this, this afternoon is to share your name and your organization if you're here representing an organization. And then just what's one word that comes to mind for you when you hear the word meetings? So you do not need to explain uh, why that is the one word that comes to mind for you, but just share your name, your organization, if that's applicable, and one word that comes to mind for you uh, when you hear the word meetings. And I'm going to stop sharing just so I can see all of you while we do this. And the first, and I've been writing your names down as you've been as you were joining. So hopefully I've captured everybody. But I'm going to start with Jacqueline. Hi there, I'm Jacqueline Hi. Cook. I'm Jacqueline Cook, and I am on a neighborhood association board. And we have a lot. Of, and I attended a couple of meetings this morning from the with the city. So just brought back. And my one word that I can think of is when I was at work, when, when I was working on retired now, when I was working, we had a lot of meetings. So that's what I would say. So you use lot. the word a lot. Awesome, Jacqueline. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Thank so, you. Yeah, you, you bet. I'm going to, um, in the interest of our, our time, I want to make sure as we're, as you're checking in your name, your organization, and one word so that we can move through everyone uh, as quickly as we can. Nikki, how about for you? Hi, I'm Nikki. I'm with Energize Our Neighborhoods um, as well. Uh, connection. Fantastic. Thank you, Nikki. Welcome. And Linda. I think Linda might be in the talking to me in the chat. Yeah, so maybe that's Lynn. Okay, Linda, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Linda Paul, South Boise Village Neighborhood Association. Ugh. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. I think you're not alone, hence the, hence the popularity of this particular topic. Uh, welcome. Glad that you're here. Amanda. I'm Amanda. I uh, work in marketing and I'm also on the Winstead Park uh, Neighborhood Association Board. And my word is uh, exhausting. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Welcome. Uh, Melinda. All right, Melinda McGoldrick with Energize Our Neighborhoods. And my word is relationship building. Great. Thank you, Melinda. And Lynn, who does not have audio, um, she says, here's her intro. I'm Lynn Lockhart with Morris Hill, and her one word is happy. Thank you, Lynn, for sharing that and for checking in via the chat. Uh, Suzanne. Hi, I'm Suzanne Yaley. I'm part of the North End Neighborhood Association, and information is my word. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. Welcome. Joe. I'm uh, Joe Legu. I'm a board member of Centennial Neighborhood Association, and I'll, I'll take two words, productive collaboration. Great. Thanks, Joe. David. Hi, everybody. Uh, David Anderson. I'm on the board of the West End Neighborhood Association, and uh, I think of effective meetings. Great. Thank you, David. And Kathy. Oops, Kathy, I think you're still on mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Kathy Corliss and um, I'm president of the South Cole Neighborhood Association. And when I think of meetings, I think of exactly what the same word Linda shared with UGG. I do, I do work and we have lots of meetings. <laughs> Great, thanks Kathy. And Stephanie. Thanks. I don't know if Stephanie has audio, but she shared in the chat that she is with Health and Welfare in the Central Bench Neighborhood Association, and her word is community. Fantastic. And have I missed anybody who's uh, signed in that I was unable to write your name down? Okay, hearing none. Uh, welcome to each of you, and thank you so much for participating and for checking in. Uh, we're going to move uh, to our 12.05 time slot. We're a little bit um, behind our time, just knowing ha having this many people check in, which is fantastic. I'm glad that you're here. Um, but I want to provide an overview of our workshop plan for today, um, our strategic intent, and our outcomes. So let me share again my screen. 
And again, this is a meeting template um, that I'm going to be uh, sharing with you why we use this particular meeting template. Is there a volunteer who is willing to read for us uh, the context section on page one that I'm currently highlighting? Is there somebody who'd be willing to read the context out loud? If so, just take yourself off mute and go ahead and, and, and share with us what's in the context. David, is that something that you'd be willing to do? Sure, not a problem. Okay. Thanks. Not a problem. Um, I'm gonna keep my video shut off just so you don't see my awkward face reading my screen. Is that okay? That's totally cool, yeah. Okay, all right, so context. Meetings are the foundational organizing unit of our work lives and are at the heart of how we accomplish change initiatives. Yet, do you ever sit in meetings and wonder, why am I here? Why are we talking about this again? What are we doing? When will I have the opportunity to speak? Why are only a few people monopolizing the discussion, especially on Zoom? Are we really getting our team's best ideas on the table? Do you ever leave meetings regretful or the time spent, uncertain of the work that was accomplished or unclear about your next steps? Our pressured lives can leave us feeling we have too much to do and too little time to waste. Imagine a world in which meetings are powerful, problem solving engines and participatory, where participants are energized, productive and even glad to have attended. Imagine a world in which the voices in the room, including yours, are heard equally and a collective wisdom is leveraged. This is a world where meetings generate the changes we seek and courageously move our work forward. You'll leave this session with the strategies and tools you can apply immediately to make your meetings more powerful, productive, and inclusive. Fantastic, thank you, David. So that is the context, our shared context for why we're here today. Um, is there someone else who would be willing to read aloud our intent and intended outcomes? If so, just take yourself off mute. You don't need to go on video and, and model exactly in the way that David just did uh, by reading our intent and intended outcomes. Linda, could I ask you to do that? Sorry, I just left you a message in the chat. I've got somebody at the house doing some oh, work okay. and so okay. it just won't work for me. Thank you. Okay, you're so welcome. All right, I will read our intent and intended outcome. So our intent for today is to have an increased understanding and ability to create powerful, productive and inclusive meetings. So that is the overarching reason for why we're each here. And our intended outcomes are six. Number one, a shared understanding around the pain and promise of meetings. Um, number two, increased understanding of what elements, oops, sorry, I'm moving that, I forgot I was sharing my screen, I was trying to put it in front of my camera. Increased understanding of what elements make up powerful and productive meetings. Number three, increased ability to articulate meeting outcomes. Number four, increased ability to distinguish between meeting processes and content. Number five, increased confidence that you can create powerful meetings. And number six, increased relationship and community between and amongst the members of this group. So those are our six intended outcomes. And now I'd like to orient us to how we'll be spending our time. At 1210, a little bit behind schedule, we're gonna be moving into a piece of content, um, introducing uh, some fundamental concepts for meetings. At 12.25, we're gonna spend uh, 15 minutes on very specifically on intended outcomes, helping you build the skill of articulating intended outcomes for meetings. At 12.40, we're gonna move into a 15 minute piece of content um, called process and content and the, the skill of learning how to distinguish between process and content. And then at 12.55, we'll conclude our session with a checkout. So that is how we will be spending our time. Um, one of the reasons why we spend time reading the context, intent, and intended outcomes, and then walking through the meeting design is because it allows our egos to be oriented to uh, the plan for the meeting. And when our egos are oriented, they are, they're more greatly at rest, which allows us to engage in a different way um, as a group. 
So what I'd like to do now is move into our first piece of content um, on meetings themselves. And we're gonna be using uh, some technology in, integrated into this presentation called Slido. So you can join me in Slido uh, in a couple of different ways. Simply open your phone and hold it up to this QR code and it will take you to our session for today. Um, you can also um, open a separate browser if you'd like on your PC and um, go to slido.com and use the energize ed meet code to join us in slido so i'm going to i'm going to um, introduce this piece of content and then we'll be using slido for our interaction throughout the rest of our presentation all right, so meetings change and impact. Um, meetings are kind of an unsexy topic. I like to say they're decidedly unsexy, but they absolutely matter in terms of how we get work done and how we engage with each other. Um, so this is a quote from a fantastic book called Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. And the, the quote is that what we practice at the small scale sets the patterns for the whole system. The way I like to think about meetings is that they are really the fractal unit of our organizational lives and what we do in them matters and how we do it matters. So they really, they set the tone and the pattern uh, for our ways of relating and for our ways of working, whether that's in our organizations or in our neighborhoods. When we think about inclusion, change and in meetings, um, they're absolutely interrelated. So, Meetings are the primary vehicle where real-time problem solving and work gets done. Uh, so we like to think about meetings as being problem solving bounded in time. Meetings are where relationships are built. They're also, quite frankly, where relationships can be eroded. And as the microcosm of our organizational culture, it's important that we ask ourselves an organization that can be applicable in a, in a traditional organization. I also think it's applicable in the context of a neighborhood association as an organization. Um, are they collaborative? Are they inclusive? Do we as the designers and facilitators of our meetings know how to tap into the collective wisdom of our group so that we're identifying solutions that are creative and innovative and sustainable? Are we intentionally building community in the context of our meetings? So meetings, from, from my perspective, from Strello's perspective, can and should embody an operationalized inclusion, mindsets, goals, and approaches. So I'd like to ask uh, you a question, and this is where you have the chance to engage in Slido. This is super fun when we get um, more people in, in Slido answering questions. So one of the things that I think is really important to anchor ourselves is what's our definition of a meeting. So I'm curious to hear from each of you. Um, if you had to define a meeting, how would you define it? So go ahead and type your answers in Slido. People coming together to share ideas, plans, and get things done, problem solving. Excellent. A gathering of, ooh, here's, I love this specific one, a gathering of two plus people to discuss a specific topic or make a decision. Great. A gathering to define and deliver an intended outcome. Bringing together ideas and developing solutions and actions. Great. So already you guys are um, of the mind frame, which I think is fantastic, that a lot is possible um, in meetings, even though they often are painful um, for many of us as you shared in your check-in. So Strella's definition um, of a meeting is uh, two or more people, when two or more people endeavor to ac accomplish something meaningful in real time. So again, two or more people endeavor to accomplish something meaningful in real time. So I I hope you see uh, many of your ideas and definitions about meetings encapsulated in the way that we're looking at meetings as well. So now I'm curious to understand, um, what are your top pet peeves? Frustrations, disappointments, irritants, that thing that makes you go, ugh. Um, what are your top pet peeves with meetings? Tangents, absolutely, right? Can't stay on topic, like 
chasing squirrels, as we sometimes say. What else? What else makes them frustrating or disappointing? The host not being prepared with an agenda or a plan. Yeah, absolutely. Poor facilitation. <laughs> People who go on and on. Uh, negative attitudes. Starting late. Yeah, and it's so interesting. I think you can tell a lot about a culture um, that's when they start late. Uh, going over time, people who monopolize the conversation, getting off topic. Oh, shoot, sorry. Um, yes, length, tangents, no agenda, no one collecting action items, points, assigning to-dos. Absolutely, these are all um, very frustrating elements of meetings. So if these are our common frustrations and irritants, like what do we do about them? How can we have powerful, productive, and inclusive meetings? So one of the things I wanna to introduce to you um, as a way of thinking about this are what we call the five W's of powerful and productive meetings. So we know we have common meeting disappointments um, and we know that we're seeking to improve our meetings. Um, how do we do that? And the way that we do that is to address these five questions. So when we're designing great meetings, when we're facilitating great meetings, we're thinking about, um, what? What do we want to accomplish? So in today's conversation, um, our intent and our intended outcomes are anchoring us in what do we want to accomplish? We're also thinking about and we're very explicitly addressing um, how we should engage in the meeting topic. So when we dive into our skill of distinguishing process and content, we're going to talk about this further, but how we should engage in the meeting topics. We also want to be explicit and clear about who. That's who is supposed to do what before, during, and after the meeting. That also includes who's facilitating and who's participating. We want to offer uh, a why. We need to address why are we talking about this? What is relevant about this particular information or topic now? We also want to address when. When will we transition from each topic to cover all of the other topics? So when we address these five W's, we're immediately creating the conditions um, and creating the structure, both form and function, that will allow us to have a powerful, a productive, and inclusive meeting. And the way that we advocate and that I'm offering you today um, to do that is to use a shared, what we call a shared approach or a meeting plan that guides your meetings to address those five W's. So in your uh, meeting design that I've shared for today, at the top of the document, um, there is a section that says resources. Um, there is a link to this particular meeting plan template that you are free to download and to use. Um, what I wanna do quickly is talk to you about what's in this particular meeting template and how it operationalizes the, uh, the five W's that I've just shared. So at the top of the meeting document, we're talking about what and when. Um, I know this might seem kind of rudimentary, but often we overlook the details of like exactly when we're meeting and exactly um, uh, how we're getting together, right? So that include the what and when includes technology details, room details. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've been in big organizations where people show up in the wrong conference room uh, for a meeting. So we're making very explicit uh, what and when of the meeting. This next, um, we also address both what and how, and that shows up in um, thinking about preparation. Um, Many times we're unable to capitalize on the collective wisdom of a group uh, because we haven't given enough thought to what they might need to do before they come to the meeting in order to best contribute, right? In order for us as the designer and the facilitator to best elicit their collective wisdom. So we wanna make explicit um, what we expect of participants prior to coming. And they need to know um, what and how to do, to do that thoughtful pre-work. We also want to make explicit, um, and you're probably going to be hearing a, a theme with that word if it's not, if you're not picking up on it already, um, who, who are playing the primary roles in the meeting. Uh, so the first role is that of participant, and we use that word participant very explicitly. They're not attendees, right, but they are participants because we're expecting contribution from those who are joining the meeting. Um, allowing being explicit about who's joining a meeting allows others to see who's coming. Um, it allows us also to sometimes see who we might be missing, 
right? So a tool of inclusion is actually being explicit and clear about why particular people have been invited. We also wanna specify who is the facilitator. And oftentimes uh, we will also specify the role of the recorder if that's important for the meeting. Then we talk about uh, content, uh, context and intent, these next two fields. Um, both of those fields address why, right? They help orient the group to why the meeting is in occurring. The context is something that is well-written. It's brief and historical context about the current state and it foreshadows the future state, right? It's giving a, a foreshadowing of what we're hoping to accomplish by having this group of people, this particular group of people come together. Um, we want the context to be enrolling, right? It's something that makes you quickly understand as a participant why you are there, and ideally it increases your desire to engage. The intent is the overarching intent for the meeting. It puts the work of the team in the most strategic and powerful context possible. And then we also articulate in our what intended outcomes. So these are all the things and we articulate them as noun or end states, which we'll be talking about, that are required to accomplish our intent. Then we move into this section of the agenda that has both the when, what, how, and who columns. So we're making, again, very explicit when we're, start, when we're moving from topic to topic, um, specifically what intended outcome that particular part of the meeting is designed to accomplish. We're making explicit how we're going to engage in that particular piece of content and who is responsible for leading that. So this explicitness uh, throughout the meeting template across these dimensions helps to create the conditions uh, for being productive, but they also create the conditions for being inclusive. The final thing I'll say about the meeting template before I pause for questions um, is that it can seem like a lot. Um, and in some settings it is. So the overarching guidance I would provide is consider your setting. Is it formal? Is it informal? Are the stakes high or low? And consider your audience, right? How much they know one another, how well they work together, how many people there are will help you to determine which dimensions or which elements of the meeting template um, are most useful uh, for that particular meeting. And use what works, right? If it's just using intended outcomes, great. If it's starting with simple processes, fantastic. Um, if it's integrating a check-in and a check-out, like we're modeling in this meeting, what, that's fantastic. A check-in and a check-out can do wonders for just uh, creating a feeling of inclusion and increasing participation in your meeting. One of the ways that I like to think about this is that often the cost of a meeting based on their participants and their time invested um, is a lot, right? So if I think about the meeting in terms of what will be wasted if we don't accomplish our intent and intended outcomes, it guides me to know how much process and structure to put around that particular meeting. So with that, in the interest of time, I'm gonna pause um, and see if there are any questions about the meeting template before we move into our next skill of uh, intended outcomes. Okay, hearing none. Um, I want to just show you as a point of modeling, uh, we are we are moving into our piece of content on intended outcomes. And uh, we were intending to start at 1225. We're starting this piece of content at 1230. We have um, a five-step process, which I think I will do in four steps to help us make up a little bit of time. So I'm going to do some presenting around outcome-based thinking. That's step one. Step two is you are going to engage in a Slido poll. Um, and then step four, which, which we're, uh, we're going to, step three and step four, which I will introduce you to, is an exercise that you can do um, to begin to build your own skill around articulating intended outcomes. And I think in the interest of time, we'll do this out. I'll leave this with you as something you can do outside of this particular workshop. And then we'll take a moment for questions and answers. So uh, intended outcomes, one of my most uh, favorite strategic skills for designing meetings. Intended outcomes um, are the what do we want to accomplish. So we're starting with the first W of our five W's of powerful and productive meetings. 
learning to think in and articulate intended outcomes is a foundational skill um, to leading change. And it's a foundational skill to designing powerful and productive meetings. So what are intended outcomes? Um, we define intended outcomes as a goal or end state to be achieved as a result of a particular section of a meeting. So they are not activities and they are not topics. What we often see in typical meetings are activities and topics. So beginning to think um, in intended outcomes is um, oftentimes, it's kind of a, a kind of a brain buster for, for those of us who are just starting this particular skill. So I wanna show you um, some examples um, of bad intended outcomes and how they might be better. Um, so you have probably been in a meeting where there is an agenda item that says review action items. Okay, that is an action, that is an activity, that is not an intended outcome. Um, a better articulation of that as an intended outcome would be shared understanding of actions resulting from the last meeting. Maybe you've been in a meeting where there's something on the agenda like discuss an upcoming event. Again, also an activity, um, not an outcome. If I saw that on a meeting agenda, I would ask myself for the sake of what? Like, what are we hoping to accomplish by having this particular conversation? A better articulation of that as an intended outcome is a list of possible venues for our next event. And then the all too common status update. We're having a status update. Okay, why? Why are we having a status update? For what purpose are we talking about status? Like what are we hoping to achieve by having a conversation about status? And a better articulation of that is alignment around the current status of our project. Okay, fantastic. Now I know why we're having that conversation. We need to be aligned between and amongst us about the current state. So it can be really, really hard to begin to start thinking about um, intended outcomes. Our, we're just wired um, and we're enculturated in our organizations to think in terms of activity and to be wired to want to get stuff done. So there are six different kinds of action that we can take in a meeting that lead to or inform our intended outcomes. And this framework is really, really helpful um, as we're beginning to train our brains to shift from activity to outcome. Um, so those six categories are share information. So we might be reviewing a report or listening to a presentation. Uh, we might want to obtain input. So we might wanna seek the team's perspective on a particular topic. We might want to advance thinking. So that's an activity that we can do. That's one of the highest forms of collaboration that we can do in, in, with a group of people. So we might wanna move our thinking forward on a particular topic. We might want to make a decision. Um, we need clear direction on something. So we're hoping to have a decision. Uh, we may want to obtain action. So we need the group or the team to do something or take action in a particular direction. And then one of my favorite categories of outcomes, and, I, and this is particularly important with our, our inclusion lens on, is that of building community, right? So this is what we're wanting to do with the team. What's the outcome that we want to build, elevate, or reinforce for the team uh, because of this meeting? So like today, we have an outcome for ourselves of increased relationship and community between and amongst the members of this group, which we started to do by the process of checking in. So we're always wanting to make an, ex an outcome explicit for the team in terms of what will be different for them as a group. So the overarching question, which I've alluded to that I like to ask myself um, and others when beginning to articulate intended outcomes is for the sake of what? What do I want to have as a result of engaging in this activity? So here's, um, Here's some examples across those six categories of intended outcomes. And these are probably something that you might see on a typical agenda. So you might see on the agenda fundraising event. Okay, so, so what, right? So for the sake of what is probably what I should say. So we have fundraising event on the agenda. So for the sake of what? We can imagine that particular um, topic or activity being articulated as a different intended outcome across each of these six, um, depending on what we're seeking to accomplish. So if sharing information um, is what we're after, well, the outcome is probably something like clarity around 
current status of our fundraising plans. If our goal is advancing thinking, right? And again, the topic is fundraising event. Maybe the outcome is something like increased understanding of what we will do better this year versus last year. Or if it's obtaining action, a clear, a list of clear next steps with point persons and deadlines. So you can begin to see that by taking something as simple and likely common and as nondescript as fundraising event, when we start using the categories of intended outcomes to inform how we might articulate um, something more clear, specific, strategic, and meaningful for our group, um, that happens when we're using this framework. And again, our leading question is for, for the sake of what? Why are we engaging in this particular topic or activity? So now I'm curious and I'd like to hear from you. I have a couple of questions about intended outcomes. Um, so the first question is in meetings I attend, which category of intended outcome do I most commonly encounter? Share information, obtain input, advance thinking, make decisions, obtain action or build community. So I'm curious to hear from you. Um, in the meetings that you attend, what's most common? Great. We have three responses. I'm going to give you guys a few minutes more to respond. So quite a, quite a bit of obtaining input, which is great to see. Um, a lot of sharing information. I think that's really common. Um, and then maybe a couple of making decisions. Some obtaining action. Awesome. More sharing, yep, sharing information. Looks like we have another, we have responses still coming in. So I'm going to pause for just a minute, a minute more. So 50% of you say the most common thing that you experience in meetings is sharing information. Um, some of you obtaining input in a couple, making decisions and obtaining action. Um, it doesn't look like there's anybody who said uh, advancing thinking or building community. And I would uh, suggest that your responses are relatively typical, right? Most of our meetings tend to have a high degree of sharing information, which I would articulate or which say is, is really not the highest and best use of a group's time. So um, oh, look, you've, you've jumped ahead, this is awesome. So in meetings I attend, which category of intended outcomes do I least commonly encounter? Obtaining action and building community, yeah. Excellent, so I'm going to, I'm gonna share with you um, this activity, we're not going to, we're not going to do this just because of the interest of time, but I want to orient you um, to this because it may be useful for you and also point you to a resource. So you have um, in the resources section, there's a handout, it's handout number one, it's on our meeting design and you can link to it. Um, it says intended outcomes handout. So please feel free to download this particular handout. Um, it has each of the six categories of intended outcome. It has activities that are often associated with that particular um, intended outcome. And then it has some suggested, some suggested language so that you can begin to practice the skill of articulating intended outcomes. Um, if you choose to take yourself through this exercise, the exercise is to think about um, a meeting that you've experienced recently and a topic that was in that particular meeting. Then think about um, which, which, in, which intended outcome category do you think that topic belonged to in its current state, like in its old state? And then try to reimagine um, how that same topic might um, be higher served as a different category of intended outcome and articulate that new intended outcome. So maybe you're able to take something that was share information and, and turn it into obtaining input or sharing information to advancing thinking. So it's the point of this exercise is to help you through that particular thought progression. So I'll leave this with you. You'll have these slides as well as the intended outcome handout. I'm going to skip through that. So any thoughts or questions about um, intended outcomes? If you do, just take yourself off mute or pop them in the chat. I 
Okay, hearing none, we're gonna move into my next, uh, next piece of content. And again, we're revisiting the five W's and we're specifically gonna be talking about how. So how we should engage in the meeting topics. Um, and the distinction that we make um, in, this, in, in this particular how is the distinction between content and process. This is one of the most strategic skills you can have for designing and facilitating inclusive meetings. So meeting outcomes and process steps. Um, each intended outcome, which we've just talked about how we're articulating intended outcomes, must be accompanied by a supporting piece of both process and content. So the content is the what, is the thing that we're working on, and the process is how, how we will engage with the what. So every intended outcome is supported by those two things, its own content and an accompanying, an accompanying process. Our mantra when we're designing and facilitating meetings is that every piece of content must have a process. So now I'm gonna, we're gonna take that same example of fundraising um, and we've upgraded um, our agenda to these potentially six more strategic intended outcomes. Now for each of these intended outcomes, we have to decide how we're going to achieve that particular outcome. And that decision, that choice requires that we address two things, the content that we need and how we will engage with that content or our process. So here's an example. Um, if our intended outcome is clarity around current state of our fundraising plans, so that's our intended outcome. We've already upgraded from like, you know, fundraising event to a, a, a share information intended outcome, clarity around status of fundraising event. And now we have to make uh, the decision about what content supports that intended outcome and what process. So the content in this case are our sub-team status reports as an example, and our process um, is three steps. One, sub-team lead presents the status report. Two, we'll take questions and answers. And three, uh, we'll dialogue to align on any open issues. So that's our content and our process. So you might be saying to yourself, that seems like a lot of work. Um, and um, it can be a, a lot of work, but let's talk about why it matters. So this is what we, we call the tyranny of implicit processes and, and, or, and or non-inclusive processes. Um, if you've ever sat in a meeting, which it sounds like you have based on part of our check-ins, um, and wondered what we're doing, when do I get to talk or ask a question, um, are we getting our best ideas on the table or how can we do that? How we've generated 5 million options. How are we going to narrow those to the best choice? Are we really getting anything done? When will the over talkers stop talking? Those are all symptoms of implicit or non-inclusive processes in your meetings. So there's many, many benefits um, of explicit processes. And I want to talk a little bit about these. Um, the first is has to do with our egos. So the role of our ego in our psyche is psychological, is to keep us safe, right? Even in a meeting, right? Our egos are, are, are constantly like, okay, who do I know? Who do I not know? Am I safe here? Should I speak? Should I not speak? When we know how we're going to engage with each other and what we're going to be engaging around, um, we, we subconsciously relax. Um, so having explicit processes enables this subconscious process to happen. The second benefit of explicit processes is psychological safety. So we define psychological safety as the feeling and the belief that our ideas are welcome and that we can freely be and express ourselves without fear of rejection or even worse, retribution. Explicit processes create predictability. Again, they tell us what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, with whom it's going to happen, when it's going to happen. And that predictability allows us to build the condition of psychological safety. And that condition of psychological safety is an essential precondition for a team to engage in real-time problem-solving creativity and innovation. 
So some things to think about um, as you are beginning to design processes. The first thing that I wanna say is that there is a second resource um, in the meeting design that you can link to, it's a PDF called Outcomes and Processes. And it gives you some sample processes and some guides um, to how to do this. Some things to think about as you're designing processes for your meeting. You wanna start with your intended outcomes. So you need a process that is sufficient to accomplish your intended outcomes. No more, no less. Um, you want to be thinking about the number and diversity of participants. So how large or small is my group? How well do they know each other? How many different perspectives do I expect to hear in the meeting? Um, do I know if this particular topic is, comes with inherent conflict or maybe an inherent alignment? We, we believe that the collective wisdom of the room, which you've probably heard me say at least four or five times already, far outweighs that of any individual. Um, so when we're designing inclusive meetings and thinking about how to capitalize on that collective wisdom, it also means that we need to ensure that all voices are heard. How can we accommodate different backgrounds, genders, thinking and behavioral preferences? How can we create space in the processes that we design for people to engage fully? The other thing that we're thinking about is the complexity of the content, right? So if I am leading my neighborhood association through the process of building our strategic plan, that is far more complicated than making a tactical decision. So we need to right size the process, right? Too much process for simple content makes our, our meeting participants go crazy. And under design processes for the complexity of the content will deter us from reaching our desired outcomes. So if you've been in a meeting where you're trying to do complex works and things go a bit haywire, it's likely because the process to support the complexity of that work was insufficient. We also need to be thinking about the stakes of the meeting, right? Is it key to kicking off our strategic plan? Um, are we seeking to gain commitment from key stakeholders? Those stakes will inform um, the level of complexity of our process. And particularly true in our world right now is thinking about our digital and physical space, right? How do we interact with each other um, in the digital world? So those are some considerations as you begin to think about um, and practice designing processes. I very quickly just want to show um, this particular spectrum. Um, we advocate for, and these are outlined in your handout, processes that are on the right-hand side of this chart in the we spectrum. Um, advocacy, counsel, and dialogue. Those are the, the processes with a group that are the most likely um, to create a we state or a state of inclusion with a group. And then finally, some quick takeaways um, for designing processes. Um, you want just enough process to achieve your intended outcome. Designing group processes is both an art and a science. So much of the learning is in the interplay between outcomes, group dynamics, and the impact of a particular process. So just try it and practice. Um, and to the third point, it gets easier with practice. And it is worth it. Um, I know that it, it can often feel onerous if it's, if it's something that's a new skill, um, but it is worth it because it, it helps us to reach our intended outcomes. It helps us to realize the benefit of the investment we're making in a meeting. Um, it builds community and inclusion, and it can catalyze the energy and momentum of a group. So now I have a question for you, uh, which is how might having more explicit and inclusive meeting processes impact my level of engagement, your level of engagement, um, and participation in meetings. Give you guys a second to respond in Slido. So how am I having more explicit and inclusive meeting processes impact your engagement and participation? I would know what to expect going in and come with a better attitude. Totally. Yeah, it's really helpful to know what is expected of us before we enter. Um, much more creative and effective. More intentionality will lead to more engagement and better attitudes. 
I think intentionality is a fantastic word to use in the space of inclusion and in particularly in the space of meetings. Um, there is a level of intentionality with how we advocate that you design and facilitate meetings um, that I can guarantee you will bring a return on your investment of your time. Feeling my voice being heard, more willing to participate and share ideas if I know how they will be used. Absolutely, it is really, that's really, really important for us to know and it changes how we might be willing to engage. I appreciate that a lot. Promotes rewarding engagement and accomplishment. It definitely takes longer to make any decisions. Um, it can, it doesn't always have to. Um, it depends on the level of, um, depends on how you're, how you're making a decision, which is a whole other conversation about distinguishing between process and content. Um, I think once we get good at designing uh, processes, um, it doesn't necessarily have to take longer in the meeting to make decisions. I absolutely appreciate these answers. I think you guys are seeing um, what can be possible when we take the time to design uh, more inclusive processes. So I wanna pause quickly, uh, it's 1253, um, before we move to our last um, piece of content. Any questions about um, designing meeting processes? Uh, I have a question. Yeah. I put it in the chat, but I'll, I'll try and do this verbally okay. too. Um, in, in my experience with, with meetings, especially uh, with people who uh, don't attend meetings very often, the meetings get, tend to get derailed by one or two individuals who like to hear themselves speak. And I'm wondering how intentionality can um, control those, cannot control those situations, but perhaps um, avoid that type of a situation. Yeah, fantastic question. And who, who, who it's hard for me to tell who the question Linda. is. It's Linda, Linda. Okay, Linda, thank you so much, Linda. Uh -huh. um, so I, what, here's my answer to that question. Um, Meeting processes are what I would call a prevention. So and, and they help us to avoid, like you're articulating, um, these kinds of situations. And so the, the way that I would do that is if you were using, let's say, council process, um, you would time box that. So you would say, we're going to use council process. As the facilitator, you would explain what that process is and why we use it. And then each person would have a specific amount of time to respond to whatever your council prompt or conversation is. So every person gets one minute as an example. That communicates to your people who like to talk a lot that there's intentionality around creating space for every person in the meeting uh, to engage. Now that is a prevention if, if they are unwilling to honor the process in the meeting then what you as a facilitator have to do is to intervene, which we would call an intervention and remind them of the process and potentially interrupt them um, and ask them to keep their, their comments or their dialogue to the time that's been allotted for each person. So it might require both uh, the, pr the prevention of explicit processes and then also some stronger facilitation uh, depending on the personalities. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Any other questions about processes before we bring ourselves to a close? I appreciate your question, Linda, thank you. Okay, um, so a few things just to share with you. Um, these are the elements that you've experienced today uh, of an inclusive meeting. Meeting plan, we started with council process, we used polls, uh, we checked in, we had intended outcomes, we had explicit processes. Uh, we also addressed the four W's uh, in the agenda. So some final rules of thumb for planning. Um, outcomes drive the process steps. So just really be anchored and guided by your intended outcomes. Visualize the, the meeting unfolding in your mind. Anticipate what can go wrong. Um, and a, a good rule of thumb is giving yourself at least 50% of the time of the meeting 
to plan for a productive meeting. So if it's a two hour meeting, it's probably gonna take about at least an hour to plan. Um, and that investment, um, I hope you're seeing, right, is worth it. Uh, this is a quote from my business partner. Um, all meetings are, are planned, most are poorly planned. Even when you don't plan a meeting, um, that's still a plan, which I like. I like that particular quote. Um, here are a couple of um, ways you can be, you can contact uh, me if you have additional questions. We welcome you to connect with us on LinkedIn. Uh, my email address is available here as is Strello's website. Um, this particular uh, one hour experience is very, very condensed. Um, we do lots of other work uh, more broadly on meetings. Um, this topic is also part of a broader leadership development curriculum that Strello offers on leading and achieving strategic change, um, if that might be of interest to you. And then lastly, I do wanna make sure that I point you back to the resources that are in our meeting plan. Um, there's the intended outcomes handout. There's the handout on outcomes and processes. There's some tips and techniques for inclusive virtual meetings. And there's also a meeting plan template like you've experienced today. So my question for you as we check out at 12.58, because I want to make sure we do end on time, is which element do you commit to practicing in order to create more powerful and inclusive meetings? So thinking about what we talked about today, explicit processes, intended outcomes, the meeting plan, any dimension of the five W's, planning for meetings intentionally, having a plan, excellent. What else? Anybody, anybody wanna try a check-in or a check-out in your next meeting? It'll, ch it'll change the game dramatically. Council process and intention. Yeah, I love I love council process. Council process is amazing in building relationship and connection amongst a group. Um, defining intended outcomes, fantastic. All right. Well, um, I, I again I want to honor your time. Thank you for joining today. Thank you to Melinda and the city for having Strello. Um, and if I can answer any questions or be a resource, please know that I'm available um, via email or LinkedIn. Thank this you so much, Kevin. Good. good. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see you guys. Thank, Thank you so all for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to let you all know we do have one more workshop in this series. It's not happening next week. So next week you get a Wednesday off. But the last Wednesday of the month, the 28th, we will have our last workshop and it will also be 12 to one and that is on the power of diversity. So really learning some tips and tools for engaging uh, neighborhoods as a whole and maybe some people who haven't traditionally come to your meetings, learning new ways to try to engage that broader group within your community. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, the slides and um, information that Shannon has shared with us today will be posted on our Energize website. Um, on the page there with all of our workshops listed where you hopefully, where you found this workshop and were able to sign up for this one. So thank you all and thank you, Shannon. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thanks, Shannon. Okay, bye-bye.